to think about our role, our roles in quite different ways from the ways that they're ordinarily presented to us in graduate school. And I want to propose to you a term which is uh, used in Latin America, but very rarely in the United States, um, psychosocial accompaniment as a possibility for the way we could understand our work with immigrant populations. Um, I want to give you some of the history of that term and what its implications would be for work with um, migrant individuals. So, um, as I was in graduate school, one of my placements was at Children's Hospital in Boston at a clinic called the Judge Baker Guidance Center. And it was really in that first year of clinical work with children and families that I realized that my seven years of graduate school uh, had really um, not prepared me for the work that was ahead. Because the kids I was seeing would come into my office hungry. We spend the first 20 minutes of our precious 50 minute hour eating. Um, their parents were often working two jobs, immigrant families, um, couldn't bring their children in regularly. Sometimes um, older brothers and sisters who were not attending school would bring their younger siblings in. Um, they weren't attending schools because they had no documents and the parents were afraid that uh, this would be found out and would lead to deportation of the families. So I, it's been a, a long path for me to realize that the kind of clinical theories that I learned were undergirded by uh, the dominant cultural paradigm in North America of individualism that really uh, made it impossible to understand the roots of the psychological suffering that people bring into the clinical hour. So I've migrated. Um, with the help of Paulo Freire, Ignacio Martín Barro, and other theorists um, to what is called liberation psychology, which is mobilizing um, psychologies that we have and creating psychologies that we don't have to uh, advance the causes of, of peace, of justice, and of sustainability. And in order to do that, we have to be very clear, as Sal was um, indicating, that a symptom is, is like the little part of the plant that comes up above the soil. But the root system um, goes into the community, goes into the culture, goes back generations. And to not only to understand this symptom that is uh, being suffered, which is really a sort of um, a testament to, to, this, to this root system. Not only to understand it, but to be effective in treating the causes of the suffering. Psychologists have to become historians. They have to become sociologists. They have to become advocates. They have to join movements of social change. They have to enter into solidarity. And they have to understand how to affect social policy so that the conditions that people are suffering in their lives that give rise to psychological symptomatology can be changed. So one, one writer that really affected me here was Arthur Kleinman, a psychiatrist and anthropologist, a psychiatric epidemiologist. And his work in the 1980s um, looked at the incidence of mental illness across cultures. And what did he find? He found that the following collective traumas increase the incidence of psychological suffering. They're not going to surprise you. Not just poverty, but poverty in societies where there is a vast chasm between the rich and the poor because that makes poverty particularly demoralizing. Racism, sexism, homophobia, forced migration, living in uh, places where there's no social um, infrastructure of support, violence of all kinds and at all levels. 
from domestic violence and child abuse all the way to genocide. So if, if as clinicians we open up our hearts to encounter these devastating social situations that give rise to increase what Kleinman chooses to call social suffering, then our job is cut out for us to honor what people are sharing with us by using the privileges that we have by virtue of our education and the increased social standing that our degrees give us to be advocates in the community and beyond to help change the conditions that um, cause so much distress. So I was working out those ideas and um, <laughs> decided to take a job here in Santa Barbara. I had grown up in New York and had worked as a clinician and taught in Boston for about 20 years. I decided to take a job here at Pacific Graduate Institute in 1995. I had only spent a week in California. I knew nothing about Southwest history. I had four daughters, young daughters who were in the school system, kids of color adopted. And uh, I moved here and became pretty instantly perplexed about what I was seeing here in Santa Barbara, a community that's 38% Latino. Um, my children's friends, um, or best friend, my oldest daughter's best friend from Guatemala, um, wasn't taking the driver's ed class. And she wasn't putting in her applications for college. And I would, some mornings when I was waking up early and going downtown, I'd see a sea of people on bicycles. And if I was going to pay rent for an older daughter's apartment, I would walk into a man who's since become famous for being a slumlord on the first of the month and see 200 Mexicans lined up with cash in their hand, paying for teeny tiny living spaces for their families. And I, I had been very uh, active in the North around issues of black and white um, <coughs> relations and white racism, but I didn't, I couldn't quite figure out what I was seeing. So I decided to go to um, the border to learn a little bit about it. And I took, at that point, my teenage daughters with me to, to be part of a, a, really an accompaniment in a place called Macovia Rojas, which was a small autonomous community where women from Oaxaca came to create um, a community where they would be able to support their families in a better fashion. But unfortunately, as years went on, their, com their community was on top of land that the Maquiladoras wanted. And so the, the women who were the leaders were under first house arrest and then imprisoned. And the, they were asking, the community was asking for international witnesses to, to spend some time um, to try to help what they were feared would be a displacement of their community off the land a lot of corrupt politics um, involved. On our way down to Maclovia Rojas, we went to Friendship Park and were um, talked to, um, educated by the American Friends Service Committee. Friendship Park, how many of you have been there? It's a little park where the westernmost um, point where the United States and Mexico touch right by the Pacific Ocean. And uh, I was very lucky to be there in 2001 because now you can no longer go there. Um, you can only go certain hours. A couple of times a month you put into like a little cage. Um, but at that point, you could actually put your hand through the slots and um, some children who were thin, thin enough could pretend to be in two countries at once. It was a, a park that Pat Nixon sort of gave her blessings to in the 70s, friendship part, friendship between two nations. And she, she was sort of distressed at that point with the little, little, um, little teeny fence that there was at that point. Well, I, was, I, I began to feel physically ill as I saw this, this wall. And this wall that I saw was nothing compared to the wall 
that's gone up since then, as you know, which is called the Triple Wall, um, built on the design of the Berlin Wall, um, made out of the corrugated landing strips of the First Iraq War, um, and now fortified with the most uh, high, uh, high military um, sensors, ground sensors, surveillance equipment, drones, et cetera, that you can imagine. At any rate, I, I, I felt uh, I had not thought I would be spending 11 years of my life on immigration, but there I was at this wall, and I felt sick to think that two friendly nations could be divided in such a fierce and hostile way. Um, and have only, as I've traveled now, the, the expanse of the border from Brownsville to San Diego, I can only tell you <laughs> it's an insane, insane situation. So I began to be part of human rights delegations to Mexico to try to understand um, the causes of forced migration and also to ones at the border and involved in different humanitarian efforts at the border to help people coming through the desert. But eventually, I came back home here to Santa Barbara. It was as though I was, I was part of a process of what I would call reverse osmosis. Everybody was coming up from the border, and I was somehow driven to go into Mexico and to try to talk to people about why they were, why they were leaving. And, but then I came home, and I started, I started spending Saturdays at the, the Historical Society Library. I don't think they were very excited about what I was studying. Um, but what I was studying was the very sad situation of how in Santa Barbara here, within a 30-year period, a people was reduced to what I will call an internal colony. So from 1848 for 30 years, all land, economic, and political power was transferred from Mexicans to Anglos. The living spaces of Mexicans was constricted into very um, small areas that became very overpopulated, very poor. Women began to go to work for the first time. Men suffered a great deal of unemployment. There were epidemics that broke out because of the living conditions. So when we think about what do our young people here in Santa Barbara, Latino young people, how do they, how do they metabolize psychically their situation? when they are still, I think, part of this original internal colony that was created, that's very rarely acknowledged in the larger Anglo population. So I've been working on efforts of um, bridging Anglo-Latino communities. I think we, we have, throughout the United States, uh, a lot of work to do on uh, what I would call, at the level of truth and reconciliation commissions, if you look at the history of, of Mexico, um, the history of, of, of how Mexicans have been treated in the United States as workers, um, we have a, a, a horrible history of human rights violations that has yet to be taken count of in the country, and which, if it were, would, would help people intrapsychically. Without, without that kind of taking account and of understanding the, the burdens that your, your parents and your ancestors have undergone, the racism, the, um, the hatred, it, it's very difficult, as, as many of you know. Um, so I'm, I'm quite worried that uh, putting Latino young people into psychotherapy without a larger acknowledgement of psychosocial trauma um, can actually be a disservice because it pathologizes the individual, unfortunately, um, without giving the kind of respect and dignity that um, is occasioned for. So I wanna, I wanna change our language and I'm, I'm drawing from a tradition in Latin America around accompaniment. So I want to tell you a little bit about it. I'm, I'm very excited. I, I know it has its own potential shadows, but um, maybe we can talk about that. So accompaniment is a term currently used in social medicine, peace activism, human rights, pastoral support, and social and liberation psychologies. The concept is used when speaking of accompanying the ill 
who are also poor, those caught in prison and detention systems, political dissidents, victims of torture, and other forms of violence, as well as those forcibly displaced, those suffering from human rights violations, and those attempting to live peacefully in the face of paramilitary and military violence, as in the Acompañamiento in Colombia of the peace communities. In Latin America, psychosocial accompaniment has arisen as a role that is distinct from that of psychotherapists or of psychological researcher, though it may include elements of both of them. All of these expressions of accompaniment draw broadly on the idea of accompaniment in Christianity and most directly from liberation theology's preferential option for the poor that calls upon us to accompany, to be alongside those who are suffering the most from perniciously unjust inequalities. The root of accompaniamiento is compañera, or friend. It draws from the Latin ad cum panis, to breaking bread with one another. Dr. Paul Farmer, and I um, recommend a video that's on uh, the, the web, a conversation between uh, himself and Father Gutierrez, one of the founders of liberation psychology, on the way in which he, he took this idea of accompaniment in, as the cornerstone of this organization, Partners in Health, which as you know, created social medicine in Haiti and now in, in many other very poor sectors of, of the world. This is how Paul Farmer talks about accompaniment. To accompany someone is to go somewhere with him or her, to break bread together, to be present on a journey with a beginning and an end. There's an element of mystery, of openness in accompaniment. I'll go with you and support you on your journey wherever it leads. I don't mean and I'll keep you company and share your fate for a while. And by a while, I don't mean a little while. Accompaniment is much more often about sticking with the task until it's deemed completed by the person or people being accompanied rather than by the accompanier. While keeping, end of quote, while keeping company on the journey, the accompanier, depending on the needs and desires of those accompanied, may provide individual and community witness and support, solidarity in relevant social movements, assistance with networking with communities at a distance suffering similar conditions, and help in educating civil society about the difficulties suffered and needed changes. Edge, Kagan, and Stewart draw from the human rights and development fields to characterize the process of accompaniment as involving a close and continuous an invited, very important, important, invited relation based on dialogue. It invites listening, witnessing, and the offering of specific, flexible, and strategic support. They are clear that accompaniment demands our capacity to experience the pain and struggle of those we accompany, and that we refrain from strategizing on behalf of those accompanied, proposing solutions to other people's problems. Psychosocial accompaniment often involves effort to construct, construct with others liberating knowledge. Knowledge that will assist in transforming status quo arrangements that undermine the integrity of body and mind and of relations between one community and another, self and other. Paul Farmer uses the word, um, no, no, let me just skip that part. <laughs> we must acknowledge as well the functions that accompaniment provides to those who do the accompanying. While for obvious reasons, we may be used to thinking primarily about the positive effects of our professional actions on others, the horizontality of accompaniment brings into a focus the effects of being alongside on each partner. And I think actually many clinical psychologists in their office long for the kind of human relationships that accompaniment would provide. Psychosocial accompaniment as a practice is rooted in an interdependent understanding of psychological and community well-being, not in an individualistic paradigm of psychological suffering. The one who accompanies holds the individual suffering and well-being in the light of the sociocultural and historical context, making conscientization or critical consciousness the cornerstone of the practice. 
Insofar as psychological symptoms memorialize violations that have occurred, the one who it accompanies must also be a witness. The witnessing is particularly crucial when the events suffered have been repressed and denied by the wider culture. The creation of opportunities for testimony invite those who have suffered violence and social exclusion to exercise their agency and to bring their experience into the public arena to be acknowledged and witnessed, gaining a sense of self-respect and a sense of oneself as an agent in the process. As a liberation theologian, Roberto Buzietta, who, who speaks about his accompaniment of Latino immigrants in the US, he describes how the accompanier foregoes his usual safe enclosure apart from those in need. He says to opt for the poor is thus to place ourselves there, to accompany the poor person in his or her life, death, and struggle for survival. As a society, he says, we're happy to help and serve the poor as long as we don't have to walk with them where they walk. That is, as long as we can minister to them from our safe enclosures. The poor can then remain passive objects of our actions rather than friends, compañeras and compañeros, with whom we interact. As long as we can be sure that we will not have to live with them and thus have interpersonal relationships with them, we will try to help the poor, but again only from a controllable geographical distance. And in this way, clinical psychology reinscribes re the colonial paradigm from that, that, that saturates still a, a lot of it, I believe. In Latin America, the practice of accompaniment by mental health professionals has a rich history. And I refer you to Nancy Hollander's book, Love in a Time of Hate, where she talks about the, the, the moment when psychoanalysts in Argentina um, began to realize that their, their patients were telling them about the heartbreak that was being occasioned by the disappearance of their, of their adult and activist children. And the psychoanalysts came onto the streets, some of them, not all of them, to support the, the mothers of the disappeared, madres de los desaparecidos. Um, she tells us about Marie Langer, who had come from Vienna to Argentina and then had to leave um, because she was politically active. She went to Mexico, but then uh, was drafted to go to Nicaragua to help set up uh, community mental health services in a, in a way that would be supportive of people and not demeaning of them and other folks like that. I highly recommend her book. Those who, who provide psychosocial accompaniment not only provide a space where a person can share troubling symptoms and seek relief through various therapeutic methodologies, the accompanier often holds himself to, uh, opens himself to hold the tragic events that gave rise to the symptom. He struggles to help those accompanied have their stories known more widely, if they so desire, so that they can affect public policy and public memory. Psychosocial accompaniment as a practice has most often been used in relation to standing alongside those who have been forcibly displaced and with those who have been affected by violence, as in the loss of family members to violence. It is not a practice that is universalizable in a single format, but rather demands to be ethically and empathically crafted and situated in particular places with particular others. Now I want to do a little phenomenology of accompaniment. It, it steers us toward a different kind of being present as it moves away from forms of rationality that support control, management, fixing, intervening, and yes, even, quote, healing. We need to clarify that the practice of psychosocial accompaniment can occur when the one who accompanies holds the suffering that's being witnessed within a wide enough lens to see suffering in its psychological, sociocultural, and historical dimensions. To accompany also requires a fundamental reorientation of our professional subjectivity that allows us to lay aside the hierarchy of expertism and move alongside of others. It entails engaging a process of psychic decolonization that enables us to shift our position vis-a-vis -vis others rather than to reinscribe colonial hierarchies of power and value. 
is this one who accompanies? She understands that the violence, both direct and structural, and oppression that people are subjected to, has torn apart the connective tissue that binds us together. If she can only offer one thing, it is to treat each one with respect, reflecting back the preciousness and dignity of his or her life. She's often one who has left the place where she feels most comfortable and has chosen to make herself vulnerable. She may be returning to a place she originally came from or is crossing over into a place she's never been before, and this takes effort and intention. She's one who's shown up where others often fail to come, at times when showing up conveys support and solidarity. She does not disappear when staying is inconvenient. She's one who's invited in, trustworthy, reliable. To accompany another means that we have chosen upon invitation to enter into the life of another or of a community. To be frank, it means that we have the privilege and resources to be able to do so, to come and go, when those we are with often do not. The one who accompanies knows how to resist leading when it is important that others do so. She values being alongside of others, working together with them, enjoying the mutual empowerment and greater understanding that arises. She has practiced holding her plans and interpretations lightly, feeding instead her hunger to hear the desires and meanings of others. While she offers her support, she's ready to find that she is the one who will feel gratitude. Very important. Often the one who accompanies finally joins into the situations she has been separated from by virtue of her own social location, by education or birth. In doing so, her own dissociation from the wider community, from the implications of histories of oppression and violence, from her own psychic numbing against the feelings she carries in response to the knowings she silences. She's able to emerge from the dissociation of bystanding violence to being an engaged witness who participates with others to create conditions for justice and peace. And in doing so, feelings of alienation and loneliness born of individualistic modes of thinking and education, begin to lose their grip. This may mean if she's located in centers of power that the need for her advocacy will return her to her own social location in order to affect pra practices and policies that affect those at a distance. And I learned this firsthand. In 2003, I spent some time in the Zapatista communities in Chiapas, where there were a great many um, Europeans and Americans visiting. And when the Oficina de Buen Gobierno would meet with us, um, the members would be very clear, we're, we're glad to have you as guest. We hope you learn what it is like from witnessing us, what it is like to try to build an autonomous community where we're providing for our own education, our health care, the empowerment of women. Um, we're growing our own food. We, we have our own um, values in the face of paramilitary violence. But if you would like to help us, you must go back to America because it is your country <laughs> where a lot of the difficulties that we're suffering is you from. So thank you. We hope your visit will be short and write us. <laughs> the accompanier realizes that she's not the only one doing the looking, the observing. She wonders how she is seen and is willing to discover things about herself she never imagined or only feared. Her privilege is not invisible, far from it. By leaving her comfort zone, she finds what she's taken for granted about herself and her life thrown into question. She may feel shame, guilt, and embarrassment, and is willing to try to work on those. When we accompany someone, we are not on our own ground. We join them on theirs, even if this is in a refugee camp or a place not truly their own. The command we wordlessly exert in our own offices evaporates. Any plan we hold, however gingerly, is subject to the critique of many voices and displacement by other plans conceived together or conceived by community members without us. Now, I want to look at, at the implications of this for work with, with, um, with people who have migrated. and. Uh, one book I'll recommend to you is um, listed here on the handout by Mary Pfeiffer. Uh, Mary Pfeiffer said yes. 
the middle of everywhere, helping refugees enter the American community. And as you know, Mary Pfeiffer is a clinical psychologist, and she lives in Omaha, where, which you would think of as a pretty white place. But it turns out that Omaha, because of the State Department's plan of how it, how it integrates refugees, has become the, the most multicultural city in America. Um, and so she, she, she witnessed um, the limitations of clinical practice with people who were coming to the United States as refugees. And she was able to write a book that was very honest about the kinds of uh, needs people had that were different from the needs she had been trained to fulfill as a psychologist. Because oftentimes, it would be going to school, uh, going to the school with the mother whose um, immigrant children were in a classroom and the mother wasn't able to understand what the principal was trying to convey to her. Or um, taking a family and with going to the 4th of July, witnessing it with them and trying to explain what this was all about in American life. Or accompanying somebody to uh, the office where their papers were going to be examined. Or as in New York, the New Sanctuary Coalition movement has created a, a, a program of accompaniment so that when people are called for deportation, procedures, um, they can have people accompany them and also um, visit with their families to, to share in the difficulties that, that you saw in the, in the clip that Sal showed us. Um, but of all the people that I have, whose work I've witnessed, um, who are using this word accompaniment, um, the one I respect the most is Brenton Likes. She's a social psychologist at Boston College. And I became aware of her work. And I would, those of you who are interested in participatory action research, I highly recommend it to you. I think she will be a mentor. Of, of um, our approaches to research, the one that is most consistent with accompaniment is participatory action research. Because you, as the researcher, are not formulating your questions in your office, then going out and interviewing people, coming back, interpreting your own results, um, publishing them, and getting promoted. But you're working alongside a community. You're bringing your, your research skills. You're, you're willing to teach those to others that they'd like to learn. You're curious about what the questions are that the community group itself has that would advance its own vision and aims. And you are there to help um, organize people, if you will, to, to undertake research on their own behalf. Um, research that hopefully will be fed into systems of transformation so that the cycle between reflection, understanding, and action really is a cycle and not an un unconnected um, line. So Brenton Likes um, was called during the time of the, of the genocide in Guatemala to witness with Mayan and Exil women. And she, she used a process called photo voice, which some of you are aware of. And when the women brought back their pictures, they often looked like just pictures of the countryside. But when she would ask them to write or to speak their narratives of, of why they had chosen to photograph this place and that place, she found that the women were photographing mass graves um, where their family members had been in, interred and where, where very, very horrible things had happened in and around their communities. So over a period of more than a decade, she, she created very strong relationships, used a variety of um, approaches to community trauma, psychosocial trauma, um, so that when in this latest chapter of immigration history in the United States, which will go down in history, these last 10 years post 9-11, will be looked at as one of the darkest periods in the United States, particularly for Mexicans. 
um, when she became, as we all have aware of, you know, almost half a million deportations each year in the United States for the last three years, she worked. She began to work with a, a group at Boston College called the Post Deportation Human Rights Project, which uh, has offered its witness to families in in the Northeast who have suffered having members taken into de detention. Um, a detention system informed by our sunny state of California in that our prison industrial complex here simply got another market in building detention centers throughout the United States. Um, very scary places, as I'm sure some of you are aware of. Um, so more recently, through the uh, Post-Deportation Human Rights Project, she, um, Brinton Likes has been collaborating with human rights lawyers, immigrant community groups, deportees, and undocumented families to explore the effects of current detention and deportation policies on Salvadoran and Guatemalan families. She says a major goal is to reintroduce legal predictability, proportionality, compassion and respect for family unity in the, into the deportation laws in the U.S. through successfully defending individual deportees, thereby setting new precedents and creating a new area of legal representation. So here you see work that's going from listening to the interpsychic difficulties of the person, putting those into the kind of context that Sal was talking about, um, but then going uh, another step to get involved in advocacy, into legality, and into policy creation and, and um, um, striking down policies also. Through her own long-standing accompaniment of Guatemalans who suffered the genocide, she was able to bring a team of graduate students and social scientists to interview returning deportees as well as families who were separated from family members due to forced migration in Guatemala. She describes the overall project, quote, The current interdisciplinary and participatory action research project was designed to create collaborative spaces for bridging the growing chasms between citizens and non-citizens and for deepening a shared understanding of and response to injustices that immigrant families, many of which include U.S.-born citizen children, face. PAR, PAR, Participatory Action Research, is one of several critical approaches to research and seeks to develop collaborative processes that prioritize the voices and actions of those marginalized from power and resources in education, advocacy, and organizing activities that contribute to knowledge construction and material social change and or transformation. Through iterative processes, co-researchers including local community members, members of activist groups, and students and professors from universities or other institutions. Identify a problem, focus, gather information, critically analyze root causes, and press toward redressing the injustice. To realize these aspirations, Falls Borda, one of the originators of participatory action research, calls for the activist researcher to assume a moral and humanistic orientation that includes altruism and solidarity. Thus, he describes PAR as a life project, which includes research and actions. Life project, Manny is such a great um, exemplification of that. Life project. The interdisciplinary team seeks to contextualize current risks to families within a socio-historical sociopolitical and transnational framework and to collaboratively respond to current realities through community-based actions, policy development, advocacy, and organizing. Now, to me, that, that's the most beautiful vision of what a psychologist could do that I'm aware of in terms of uh, a way of moving and of being that is up to some of the critical challenges that pernicious globalization has wrought on us. Many families felt that their initial experience of being under siege in Guatemala during the war was reinscribed in the U.S. in situations where their families felt under attack by workplace and home raids, the constant threat of detention and deportation, and the steady assault of racism. 
The activities of this ongoing research program are multiple. Bi-monthly support groups, leadership development workshops, periodic meetings to discuss objectives in the research process, community feedback and planning meetings, a series of inter-organizational, community-led Know Your Rights workshops which utilize drama and small group discussions. And psychologists are perfectly suited to help assist with any or all of those activities alongside others. In community feedback sessions, community members discuss preliminary findings from data analyses, offer alternative interpretations, and engage in debate about, for example, traditional and more contemporary family patterns that constrain or facilitate how undocumented parents face threats posed to their families. So, uh, inspired by her work, I began about, I don't know, six years, five or six years ago to, uh, uh, to sit in on meetings at Pueblo, which is a gra uh, grassroots Latino ra uh, human rights organization that was here in Santa Barbara. The Santa Barbara office is now closed. It's in Santa Maria, and I believe it's now affiliating itself with Cause and Venture and Oxnard. Um, at that time, uh, I, I was trying to follow what I understood, which was I needed to cross the boundary. The cross that my thinking was, there's no way that we could be building this wall at the border if we were not already living this wall in our cities and towns in the United States. So if I want that wall to go down, I have to cross this wall here in Santa Barbara, which is like a virtual apartheid community between Mexicans and Anglos. So where are people congregating where I might be able to find an invitation or be welcomed? And so I talked with several places and decided um, that Pueblo would be good, and so I began to attend their meetings with their permission. So I would, I would just show up and I would do whatever people had needed to be done. Um, and that went on for about a year, and then one, one evening, a woman stood up, a young woman, and she said, I have a dream of something I'd really like to do here in Santa Barbara. Um, I, want to, I want to work with other people to create an oral history project where we would collect the testimonials of people living here without documents. But I need help, and I don't know exactly how to do it. So if anybody wants to help, let me know. So I was like, yes! After a year, I finally found something I can volunteer for that I have a little expertise on and that would be really interesting for me. And you'll see out on the table the result of that effort. It's a book called In the Shadows of Paradise, which we sell for $10 to um, create donations for Pueblo, so I, I uh, encourage you to buy a copy. Um, so we began to meet for about a year and a half. Um, the Immigration Committee of Pueblo, myself, one other Anglo, um, was often in Spanish, and Spanish is terrible. Um, so that it took some months before I realized that this wasn't just a research project about people in the community who are undocumented, but in fact, all the people in the room were undocumented who were working on the project. And they uh, went, after we did some initial training around um, doing oral history projects, they crafted the questions that they wanted to ask. They determined who they wanted to ask. They translated their interviews into English and Spanish because the, the idea was that this would be used as a community education device to create conversations between undocumented persons who were willing to share their experiences and the Anglo um, population in churches, community groups, in school classrooms. The book was adopted at City College and at the high school, which I'm very happy about. So they, we came back, we had about 45 interviews um, and there was a lot of debate that went on about what we should do with them. People decided how they would like this book to read, um, and they decided to 
to go through the interviews around certain key themes and pull pieces out um, so that somebody opening the book, if you wanted to know what it's like to live in Santa Barbara without a driver's license, if you don't have your documents, you can, you can get a bird's eye view. What, was it, uh, what were the things that caused you to leave your village or your city in Mexico? What was it like trying to cross the border? The first week in Santa Barbara, what were your hopes for your life here? And then in the first year, what, what did it look like as you met the obstacles? What, what are your dreams now, et cetera? So from that work um, and other research, uh, Pueblo and myself, we began to create a list. This is, uh, I, I built the list that you've got here off of something that was originally um, created by the Immigration Committee. Um, a list of the kinds of things that a community can do if you want to create a welcoming environment for uh, people without documents. And the first thing I, I, I tell everybody to do is go and read the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families because you will see what human rights violations um, the United States is, uh, is encouraging throughout, throughout the United States. Um, establishing forms of sanctuary for immigrants has always been important, and we've been clear about that um, since the 1980s. Those forms of sanctuary are, are shifting, um, but as we know, the, the forces uh, in Arizona and other places, Georgia, etc., have, and in Tennessee right now, are trying to outlaw any efforts of communities to create sanctuary, and by that I mean in particular um, allowing police forces to not opt in to secure communities, um, not become agents of, of, uh, of, of immigration and thereby disrupt um, any trust that immigrant community would have in the police. One thing I think we need here in Santa Barbara very badly is a, a worker center. Um, our research showed people in the line, the, the labor line in Cunimientos, being picked up, taken to places in Carpinteria, and imprisoned uh, with threat of death um, to leave the places where they were working, often not being given their salaries. Uh, people in other places in the United States are, are sometimes picked up by a person that they think is going to deliver them to to a job, and instead they're delivered to ICE. And then kids will, f will video these terrified people running for their lives and put it on YouTube. I mean, that's just horrible. The worker centers that are created, and I recommend to you a book by Janice Fine that describes the whole process of creating a worker center. You're able to help people um, have contracts of mutual understanding about the work, about the wages, that um, may have certain protections in terms of safety. But while people are waiting for jobs, they can also be working on language or computer skills or other things that might help them um, in, their, in their lives as workers, as well as um, education about workers' rights. Community policing, we're uh, struggling with very hard here at Santa Barbara. And many places in California. Um, I love the librarians in Los Angeles who said, look, okay, people need identification cards. We'll create identification cards. And through, through that, you know, help spur Los Angeles to get, get into the act of um, helping people have some identification so they could create bank accounts and they could travel more easily. Um, we need opportunities for children to share across, across languages and cultures. Um, the, the, the issue with driver's licenses is just com completely bound up with anxiety syndromes because of the way that um, police stops are functioning in many places in California and here in Santa Barbara. So that I, I know women in their 50s who are literally sick before they ever get to work in the morning for fear that they're going to be pulled over, and yet they can't get 
to the state that they may be working at um, without using their car. And they have children. They're afraid they're going to be separated from their children if they get pulled over. Um, so these are things which psychologists, when you hear people in your offices describing this kind of anxiety, you can use your citizenship to advocate at the city council or with the police department against some of these policies that create real problems. Um, I've wandered here in Santa Barbara, which is renowned for being one of the most philanthropic places on earth. If, if we could change the discourse in philanthropy, so that instead of it looking like um, helping, helping the poor, there could be some acknowledgement of the history that made people poor and that keeps people poor. Um, I've been very moved by Michelle Alexander's work on the, on the new Jim Crow and the, the functions of keeping uh, African Americans in a very high incarceration rate. But unfortunately, um, all the arguments I believe that she makes around the functions of creating a, a, a low caste in the American economic sin, um, system apply equally well to Mexican and Mexican Americans here who have not had this